And I'm also going to have a handout for you guys after that's going to have a lot of the kinds of questions we're going to be asking, because I think that's also going to be helpful when you do this on your own. Okay, here is the genesis of this course. Um, when the pandemic started, I kept hearing from a lot of authors who told me how hard it was to create because of all this unrest that was going on. And they were upset because they couldn't do anything with their writing. And so I immediately created this course that I just gave away everywhere I possibly could, writers organizations and that kind of thing, to help people realize that whether you're writing or not, you can always be doing a lot for your writing. Stephen King says, uh, writers, writers read and writers write. And he says it in that order. Reading is one of the most important skills you can hone analytical reading to improve your own storytelling craft. It also is incredibly helpful for you to learn how to get objectivity when you are editing your own writing, which is one of the hardest things to do. It's the most visceral way I know to really internalize a lot of the stuff. You can take all the classes in the world, but if you're not seeing this in action, it doesn't have the same effect and it's not you're not even going to get to the, you're not ever going to get to the point where it just becomes so much a part of you that you don't have to think about it when you're writing. And that's really where we want to get, because when, uh, if you've read my book, Intuitive Editing, you know that I'm kind of anti-rules, which isn't to say I don't think these, these tools and systems that people teach aren't valuable. They are. But sometimes I think writers can be trying so hard and thinking about those rules and systems so hard that they're freezing up the creativity and the voice and all the spark that's going to make their work stand out and be unique. So hopefully this is a way to bring that all um, really just deeply internalize it so that you can just write intuitively when you're writing and then bring these skills to bear when you're editing. Okay. So you guys hopefully read the first chapter. If you have it and want to pull it up, super cool. I'm going to pull my notes up on it too. We're going to do, if you are familiar with the How to Train Your Editor Brain course that I offer online, this is sort of loosely going to follow that. But basically all it is, is how I edit a book when I'm working on one. I, I go through different levels of looking at what's on the page so that I can see what the author's intentions are and how well they're coming across. Um, the first thing I do, um, let me see if I'm sharing this screen. I'm not, but we don't need it. I call the first stage just feeling the story. So when I first get a manuscript, all I do is read it like a novel. I'm not making notes. I'm not trying to um, figure out what might not be working as well as it could. I'm just orienting myself to the story, letting it wash over me. And then I kind of sit and I visit with my first impressions of it. Um, like I said, I call that feeling the story and it's kind of loose questions like, did I like it? Did I feel engaged? Did it have momentum? Did I lose interest at any point? Did the characters feel real and believable to me? Um, did I, uh, did it, did just overall, did it, did it engage me? Did I feel hooked from the beginning? Um, just to sort of break the ice and start with our discussion, I made some ridiculous polls because I thought it would be fun to have, because I thought I saw there was a tech tool and I had to use it. But also this will kind of get us dialoguing about it, hopefully. So Joel, if you will put up the first question, these are all that kind of feeling the story, big picture question. First one is just like, think about the chapter. Did you like it? Did it engage you? Did it draw you in? We'll give everyone just a sort of a minute. Okay, we have some totes my goatses. We have a few kind ofs. Uh, doesn't look like any not really. It's interesting. That's my other dog, in case you're wondering, and they're going to stop soon, I hope. Um, cool. Okay, I think we're right about, I think we got 100%. So let's end the poll. Uh, we've got 68% totes my goats engaged, 32% kind of engaged. So this is good. This is interesting. Now we're going to start to dig a little deeper into these areas in the next round. We're going to ask ourselves questions here. Let me take that off. We're going to ask ourselves questions about why we reacted the way we did. So if you are a kind, if you're in the kind of camp, can you articulate a little bit Oh, sorry. Totes my goats is my ridiculous slang that I stole from my favorite movie. I love you, man. That means like, yes, completely, totally. Um, sorry. 
And yes, Jay, you can watch this later. So if you were in the kind of camp where you weren't fully engaged, can can you guys articulate a little bit in the chat maybe why you did not feel fully engaged? What about this didn't grab you? Um, I'm in the totes and goats camp and I'm going to talk more about that later. Really? No, nobody's going to tell me this. All right, that's cool. Um, wasn't the kind of story you would prefer to read. Too much normal chat. That's interesting. Uh, we can talk about that. The voice was sort of abrasive. I found myself backing away from it. Um, I would love to talk about that when we get to the voice, actually. Not your age group or racial group. Too much posing by the characters. This is interesting. So some character stuff. Um, did read on to chapter two and too loose in places. Good. You guys are already sort of getting the hang of not just figuring out what you felt, but why you felt that way. We're really kind of forensically tracing back. The best barometer you have for analyzing your work is you. So the, and I do this as an editor, I'm paying attention, especially in that first pass, not so much to what am I seeing on the page, but how am I reacting to what's on the page? Because that's my clue. That's my, that's my little lever in to start digging around a little deeper and to know where the where the fissures might be that I might pry open and go, okay, why did this strike me this way? The other thing, I'm going to go back and do some of these comments. The other thing I want to say is that there's no right answers. Um, there are, there's no rules, as I said, there's no hard and fast. It's all gray area. This is a subjective art form and a subjective business. If anybody knew what was objectively right all the time, everybody would have Stephen King's career. So your, a lot of the comments we've even read already, you can tell that some of them are based on things like the characters didn't grab me, but some of them are just like, not my kind of story. That's always going to be the case. I have not every single story I have ever worked on is exactly up my alley. So you can still analyze a story, even if it's not engaging you, but you figure out how to analyze, is it not engaging you because this isn't your kind of story or because something is missing on the page that makes you care about the characters, the plot, the stakes, the main elements of the story. Let's do a couple more little comments about that big picture question. Some people liked it if they read, read on to chapter two. My daughter thought it was too far out of what she would normally read. So that's a personal preference. Nathan's a totes my goats. Um, had to look up some of the words. That's how I learned vocabulary as a child. So I think I love when people make me look up words. Uh, not the type of story. Thought it was well-written. Slang was unfamiliar. Okay, that we're going to come back. I'm hearing a lot of voice stuff. And so I do want to talk about that when we get a little deeper. Some repetition, series of tropes. Okay, interested in the characters. Great. So you guys are kind of already getting the hang of articulating not just what you liked and didn't like, but beginning to think about why. Let's put up another poll question just for the heck of it. Technical Joel. Okay. Um, we've already touched on this a little bit. Did the main character intrigue you? Did they feel real? Notice these are really general questions I'm asking myself at first. I'm still in that feel the story thing. We're going to get real down and dirty with it. But one of the mistakes authors often make when they are reading analytically or they think they're reading analytically, authors love to go through and annotate, pull out lines that they liked. And, you know, this was really resonant. That's great, but that is the third step. That's the icing on the cake. First, you have to see what the structure of the story itself is, the big picture bones of it. And then you have to be able to articulate and assess whether that's working and why, what might not be working. And only then do you get down to that nitty gritty line edit level. That's the last thing we'll do. But you'll, we're going to see by that point how much the author does or doesn't do, how they are created, how Angie Thomas is creating some of these effects that we're, we're observing in steps one and two. Um, okay, I'm not going to close the poll. Actually, do close the poll, please, Joel. But We've got mostly yeses who like the character. I kind of agree with that. I think it's a really strongly written character. One lone brave no and four sort ofs. Okay, let's do the last poll just to, and then we'll do a little bit more of this discussion stuff and 
about the specifics, the plot and the action. So the, notice that the, the things I put up here are the big picture things. Like I said, first we started with the story as a whole and then the character, which to me is the basis of all stories. So if the character's not grabbing you, chances are the story's not going to. But now you wanna see if the story itself is grabbing you. So the plot of the action, was there something happening that drew you in, kept you engaged, made you wanna keep turning the pages? We've got 100%, so we can close that poll. I was hooked. I could put this book down, uh, that's 65, most of you. 16% could put the book down after chapter one. 19 were um, mildly interested and might or might not read on. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to some of the questions. Well, hang on just a second. Okay, uh, we've already got the tropes, some lovely tight and powerful lines. We're gonna analyze some of those and not just that they are tight and powerful, but why. There's a lot of multitasking in this story with every line that we're gonna look at more deeply. Love the contrast. This is one of the things we're going to talk about between Star being a smart girl who doesn't drink or do drugs at a party where she feels like an outcast, which is a theme throughout the novel. Yes, it is. No matter where she is at home or at school, she doesn't feel like she fits in. I liked how hard she tries to outgrow her circumstances. Loved the voice. Oh, poor Cynthia. Reminded, <laughs> reminded me of me at that age. Not a pleasant memory. I think that recognizability is... We're going on character, so let's... Um, Let's just start with that actually and expand on this field of story. So now that we have um, this idea of what we think, how we generally feel about the story, now we're gonna take some of the areas like we are starting to already before I stopped us. And we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into specific parts of the story as to why we felt that way. We already did the questions a little bit about the story. Do we have a sense of what the story is? Do you guys, I'm going to come back to some of these comments. Do you guys have a sense of what this story is going to be about already from chapter one? And is it something that had momentum for you that continued to carry you through? Uh, Bob Cohn says he was more than ready for something to happen when Khalil showed up. Blue lights was a good exit hook. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Star Against the World, the last sentence of the chapter. Okay. I don't want to skip ahead because that is one of the things I want to talk. All right, let's do skip ahead because you guys are all really into the blue lights. So where I usually start is thinking about how I felt about the story. Was something actually happening? The way I usually think of that is there's a big picture question in every story. Will Katniss survive the Hunger Games? Will the rebels defeat the Empire? Uh, will the Avengers defeat Thanos? We're, there's something that the reader is reading to find out. After I finish my first read, can I answer that question? So do you guys have a sense? I know we've only done the first chapter, but was there a question that you wanted answered? Um, we don't necessarily need to explore that just yet. Let me build on that a little bit, and then we're going to have a little discussion. Um, and what was the story that you sensed happening? So for me, it was clear there was friction between Star, uh, Marta, you pointed out, Star had conflict between her two worlds, and that is what the story was about. There was a lot of suspense and tension elements that continually created a conflict that seemed to me to be building to the point where the gunshots start and then she and Khalil escape. And like you said, we end on the blue light. So there was a real sense to me of Star came here for one purpose, to try to be a part of a community she feels invisible in and isolated from. And then things changed, but I had a sense of how they changed and what the new question was, which is she's worried about getting caught, uh, who got shot, what does this mean for Star? Why are they being stopped? What's going to happen next? That's the story. That's the question you always want your reader to be asking. And then what happens? Because that's what keeps them from putting your book down. Um, and that also helped create the forward momentum. Now, I a couple of people said they did not <laughs> snitches get stitches. A couple of people said they did not feel that forward momentum. Bob, I know you said that until Khalil arrived. Does anybody want to raise their hand and talk about if they did not feel that forward momentum, why not? Where in the story they did not feel that? Bob, I thought you were going to be right on the hammer on that. 
All right, I'm gonna keep talking until somebody breaks the hymen and puts up a hand on some of these questions. Bob, I knew you would. Okay, um, if you would unmute Bob and then we can talk directly. We can't do it for you. So you have to, it's in your lower left corner. If you hover over the bottom bar, there's a mute button and it should be X. There you are. Good evening. Hello, friend. In my struggle, I forgot the question. I'm sorry. I'm having a little audio trouble. Oh, yeah. So you did not feel the momentum until Khalil came in. Why is that? What she had to say was interesting, but she said it a lot. I was more than ready for things to start. I thought uh, the exposition and learning who she was was uh, extended more than it might have been. Does that okay. Happen? I'm going to, I don't want to cut you short, but your audio is a little. Um... Well, I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's just, you sound like Minnie Mouse and I'm sure you don't want to. <laughs> so I'm going to try to rephrase a little bit. If I, if I misunderstand, please tell me it, uh, go ahead and mute yourself. If you wouldn't mind, if you, you felt like there was too much establishing, basically, I might be summing up a little bit too much description of who star was, um, and what was going on at the party before action started. Is that an accurate summary? And Anybody else agree with that? You can say in the chat or if you want to comment. I'm not, you're not wrong. I, I know I said that super skeptically. That's not what I meant. Um, that's a personal taste thing to some degree. And it's also not like it depends. Partly it depends what genre you might read, what your expectations are. I did not feel that way because I felt like what we were getting before that was dense, but I will say I've read it like four or five times now. And on my later reads, I did find actually that it, it was starting to feel when it was new to me, I was like, oh, this is interesting. What's going to happen? Who is this person? And I wanted to get my feet planted, but Vicky says for her, it was almost, she did feel it was slow and it was almost stereotypical of what would happen in such a party. Interesting. Chris agrees with Bob. He wanted to cut the dialogue in half and get right into the shots fired much sooner. Christine can see both sides. Jay was drawn in. So there's a fine balance to be drawn in a story. Um, you know, they always say start on the inciting event. And clearly in this case, the inciting event is the shots. Um, I always use Gone Girl as an example too. The inciting event is when Nick comes home and that door's wide open and his wife, Amy, is missing and nobody knows what happened to her and there's blood and a, signs of a struggle inside. But that comes on page 25. Um, in this case, I don't know exactly what page it is in the original, but I don't think the shoot, Khalil comes in on page 15 and the shooting starts, gosh, not until page 19. So the inciting event general kind of rule is, although I hate rules, the guiding tenet is it starts within like five to 10% of the opening of the story. And the mistake I see some authors make is to open the story on inciting event. The reason that is not always as engaging as you would think is because no matter how exciting what's happening is, if we don't know the players yet, we don't care. Readers have to care about who these characters are and invest in them before we care what happens to them. So for me, in this case, before I could be worried about a shooting at a party in a neighborhood that, that isn't necessarily familiar to me, then I need to have a reason to relate to or invest in or feel engaged with the characters. And I think that's what Angie Thomas is doing early in. We get a lot of information about who Star is what she's struggling with. And that's key. Before we can care what happens to a character, we need some sense of what, uh, to get technical, you're setting up the arc for the character. So in this story, a couple of you have already pointed out that the arc for her character has to do with integrating these two worlds, feeling invisible, feeling like she doesn't really belong in either world, this constant tension she's feeling between it. Before we understand what that is, then the inciting event of the gunshots don't really mean anything to us. And for the people who said they didn't relate because this felt 
outside of their experience. This wasn't a character that they recognized or felt that they could believe in, even more so in that case, because you're really not going to care about gunshots at a, you know, the, uh, the example I always use is if you are safely flying in a helicopter above a volcanic explosion and you see two little figures running down, it's kind of like, ooh, but it's not going to really draw you in because you don't know who they are. They, you don't relate to them. You have no feelings about them. But if you fly in a little bit closer and you see some faces <laughs> and then you see maybe, you know, it's a woman and her child and she looks terrified and she's trying to catch her kid and get her down the mountain before the lava comes. Now you feel more engaged. If it's somebody that you know something about, if I tell you that's, I don't know, Julia Roberts and her child <laughs> or whoever, you're going to have feelings about that one way or another too. So that's your job as the author is to create that familiarity and those feelings in the reader before you plunge us into the action so that we, so that we give a crap. Um, okay, let's see what other we've got. Um, did go the long way around things. A couple of people think didn't feel it was too much setup, but didn't feel you needed a one. Samantha didn't feel she knew enough about this world and needed some orientation, which I think is maybe to the point of what I was just talking about. Um, more than ready when the action started. I'm, I'm amused to find that it was a lot of the men who wanted the action to start sooner. That's not a surprise. I tried to, I'm trying to pick stuff for this series. That's a little more sort of general interest, but there's always going to be preferences. There was, okay, this is a good point, Tara. There was relationship tension with Kenya that had nothing to do with the ultimate story arc, seemed to be an unnecessary delay in the narrative. So let's talk about character for a second, because as I said, it is the basis of story. Readers don't care what's happening until we care what's who it's happening to. So what did you know about Star from this very brief, I mean, really, we read, what, 21 pages or something, which isn't a lot of time to get to know the character, but what, just list off some things you knew about Star. Um, some of you have already said, you know, that she feels out of place, that she's not a partier. What else did we get from the, from the text itself? Tons of background, fight with the other girl, relationship with Kenya, yes, uh, Garden Heights as a setting, as a character. Yeah, that's a great observation because that is a really important part of what, what Star's experience is and what's happening in this scene. Um, so we know where she lives. We know what that neighborhood is like. S felt like start and stop with Kenya and losing momentum a bit when she and her friends leave, but that might feel better with more of the story. Okay, so for me, when her friends left her, that really threw in stark relief how she felt totally out of place at this party and completely alone. And it primes the pump for when Khalil comes because even before he literally rescues her, he rescues her. Her childhood friend shows up when she is just feeling as out a fish out of water as she possibly can. Um, so we know that. We know that she's not comfortable at this party. We know she grew up with Khalil. Um, I wanna talk about Chris, bring up this point again later about her reaction to the gunshots. That's deliberate, I think. And I want to talk about why. Um, Kenya was a great counterpart to Star, Julie says. I thought she was key to show who Star was. I agree with that. For me, I felt like she was there by contrast. She's also very much of the world of Garden Heights, it seemed, whereas Star is not. And so that's a great way of indicating that. And I also like that she was Star's only friend. There's another fact we know. Um, and that says something about Star, like she clearly grew up in this neighborhood and she doesn't even know people she went to school with in third grade. Nobody seems to know her except as what? We know that too. We know her dad is Big Mav and he runs the grocery store. We also know he used to be a gangbanger. He was the head of the gangbangers, the, the King Lords, I think it was. Uh, what else do we know about her? There's a lot in here. She wanted to diffuse the situation and not escalate it. That's telling us something about who this character is. She, and that when we see that dynamic over and over, Thomas shows us she doesn't like drama. Uh, Star doesn't like drama. She doesn't, she's not interested in the gossip. She shies away. She's not going to get in a fight with Kenya. She doesn't like it or engage when Kenya's starting drama. And it's one of the things about her that drives her crazy. So we've got these establishing characteristics very subtly woven into the context. 
And notice too that it's woven in mostly as show and not tell. So we are partly seeing who this character is based on what she's telling us about herself. And we'll talk about the voice of this and the point of view in a minute, because it's Jermaine. But we're also seeing it based on what she's doing, what her behavior is, what her reactions are. Both are strong. Neither, you'll hear show, don't tell, that's not right. <laughs> show and tell each have their place. Trying to show everything would be tedious. Trying to tell everything is distancing. So finding the right balance is key. And when we go in line by line and start dissecting more, we'll look at what is show, what is tell, why did Angie Thomas use it this way? That's the key question to ask yourself. How does the author achieve the things she is achieving? Like we've listed off a ton of stuff we know about Star and I could keep going. Let's see what we've got. She's a teenager. She's insecure. She's she's styling, although I don't know if she is. I couldn't tell if if the hoodie was like a a deliberate choice or I don't care choice, but then she cared a whole bunch about her shoes. So we do have some information about we don't know necessarily what it means, but we have some information about that aspect of her. Um, internal and external dialogue conveys who she is and what she's dealing with that made her real. She has a boyfriend with whom, if you'll recall, there has been some sort of trouble. Uh, she has a best friend or a couple of best friends at her white school, where one of whom of one of whom she has some friction with right now and doesn't understand what's going on. She's gone to that school for six years. What else do we know? She doesn't fall. She's smart. Yes, she is. She's at this, what sounds like fairly elite private school. Doesn't fall under the norms of the community. Intelligent, serious, likes tennis shoes. Yeah. That her family has power in the community. I'm going to keep reading, but I just want you guys to be noticing that in these short 20-something pages, look how much Angie Thomas has layered in about the character to make her real. And this is your one of your number one challenges as an author. You want to draw us into your story. And the window you do that, the lens through which we experience it, is your character. So I keep saying, we don't care what's happening until we care who it's happening to. But sometimes the trap of that is to start telling the reader who a character is. Give us a bunch of backstory. Try to let us you know, catch us up on who this person is and draw us in. Notice how much of this is not tell and backstory. It's really smoothly woven in. A lot of it's woven in as context. You know, there's a, just to give you a quick example, on one of the first pages, she says, um, uh, people already, so Kenya says to her, stop following me and go dance star. People already say you thank you all that. I didn't, so already we know something about Star and how do we know it? Because Kenya is telling us, the reader, something about Star, but in this really organic way of something a person would say to their friend. I didn't know so many mind readers lived in Garden Heights or that people know me as anything under than big, other than Big Mav's daughter who works in the store. So now we've got information about how she feels invisible in the community and also what she does. Uh, I sip my drink and spit it back out. I knew there would be more than Hawaiian punch in it, but this is way stronger than I'm used to. This is all one paragraph where we're getting all this stuff we we noticed about her. She's not a big drinker. She's not a big partier. Um, they shouldn't even call it punch, just straight up liquor. I put it on the coffee table. So now we know, like we have seen her in action rejecting this, that show that's telling us this fact about her. Um, fo folks kill me thinking they know what I think. So that's one paragraph where we get all of that information. Um, isolated, not a people person, though she tries. She had an internal conflict that I found easy to relate to. She had a, actually, she had a lot of internal conflicts. Let's talk about some of those. One of the strongest ways to keep your reader hooked is with suspense and tension. So they're a little bit different. Um, if you guys have heard me teach before, I talk about this a lot. Suspense, they work together, but suspense creates a question in the reader's mind. Tension creates some kind of conflict or friction or obstacle. And they work together by tension kind of creates that feeling of unease in the reader and this is, and about whatever the suspense question is. So we don't really have the suspense question so much except for what's going to happen at the party. Um, is Ken, you're going to get in the fight. And then notice how Angie Thomas builds that suspense. So first it's just like, is, 
is star going to get caught by her parents is kenya going to make her get in a fight are they going to get in trouble and then kenya leaves her alone now what's going to happen and then khalil shows up and the gunshots start and now we get our big suspense question but even before that happens we have so many tensions what are the tensions you guys found in the story um Oh, I've got, you guys are really good on the character stuff. The ponytail juxtaposed with the other girls. Yeah, that's a really good detail. Um, some sexual tension with Khalil, totally. Anybody, if you want to raise your hand at any point and talk about points, please feel free. And otherwise, I'm just going to keep going to the chat. Um, I wrote down some of the suspense and tensions. You've already talked about some of them. You guys talked about the the conflict she has between these two worlds, Garden Heights and her what does she call it? Her bougie white school. <laughs> um, Star and her boyfriend, Chris, you guys already pointed that conflict out. Star and Haley, we talked about the fact that one of her friends at school has been acting weird. She doesn't know why. Star and Seven, her brother, she he frustrates her. She gets annoyed with him. He's overprotective of her. And yet she wears his hoodie, which to me was an inter another interesting sort of juxtaposition that says she may say she doesn't like it, but she loves him. She's close to him or she appreciates it. We don't know yet. It's a breadcrumb. Um, start tension with her parents. Her parents don't want her partying. And she's at this party and she's afraid they're going to find out. Do I belong here? What am I doing here? Yes. Um, uh, her discomfort at the party. Kenya picking a fight with another girl. That's not, that is Star's tension in that she's afraid she doesn't like the drama. She's afraid of being drawn into it. The gunfire's tension. Garden Heights creates tension for her. Not knowing who her that third grader when who are her third grade friend who says we had third grade and she goes oh yeah yeah I remember and they call her on her lie. Lies are a great source of tension. The way the other people at the party treat her is a source of tension. They look through her and then when they do know who she is, they either dismiss her or they denigrate her for going to this school. Um, people think she's stuck up. Absolutely. What happened to Kenya? We don't know. Did she get into the fight? Did she get shot? She's sure aching to get into that fight at the end. Between Kenda, Kenya and Danasia, yes, there's tension there. Seven is not just Kenya's brother. She's also Star's brother. Um, yeah, so look at, again, 20-something pages. Look how many elements of conflict or tension or friction Angie Thomas has woven in. What does that do? It serves as a hook for the reader, as long as we are off balance, as things are a little bit, there's some chop on the water, we're engaged. The most boring story in the world is Star went to a party and she had a really good time and then she got home and her parents didn't find out. As In life, we want everything to be smooth sailing. In fiction, in story, we want everything to be as complicated and difficult as possible. Um, I recently did uh, piece in Writer Unboxed about tension, microtension. And there's a concept you may have heard of in improv called the yes and. Anytime you're doing a scene, you don't ever deny what the person gave you that they are making up as they go. You accept it and you build on it. Conflict and tension are the exact opposite of that. <laughs> I like to think of it as the no but. It's whatever that character wants something is standing in the way of her getting it. Star wants to come to this party and have a good time and have everyone not think she's stuck up and not get caught by her parents and have nothing happen and not be bad and everything goes wrong in the course of that step by step by step. That's how you keep readers engaged with that kind of constant tension. Okay, I want to go back to character for a minute because besides um, Star, there are some supporting characters in this none of whom are the main character, but we learn a lot about them, particularly Khalil, who becomes important. And I'm not giving any spoilers here because um, it's on the back of the book. <laughs> he is, after the police stop him, them, after this chapter ends, he gets shot by the police. So that's what the inciting event for the whole story is. It kicks off Star's journey of having to figure out which loyalty, which world her loyalty resides in and who she is as a result of this crisis she's been flung into. So it's really important. Angie Thomas has one chapter to make us give a crap about a kid who's going to get shot in the next chapter on whose back the entire story rests. 
That's a big, that's a lot of weight for the character of Khalil to carry. So let's start with this question. Did y'all like Khalil? Did you not necessarily like, did you sympathize with, engage with, relate to, believe in? Was he a character that you would have read more about who intrigued you? Uh, you can give me some, yeah, we got a yes. Yes, Beatrice, Kyla, yes. Nathan, like that he was a true friend to Star. That's one way that, that's one of the character traits. And it's also one way that Angie Thomas uh, invests us in the character. Um, and here's what's interesting. Yes, he's a rescuer, sympathized with him, believable. He is painted as, and this is one of the things I think is brilliant about this story. Angie Thomas is taking what could be stereotypes and she's making them people individuals so here here rolls in a boy let's call him maybe a man just barely who is a gangbanger right who's probably selling drugs it would be really easy not to care about that character she takes great pains to make us care about that character in some of the ways you guys have pointed out does anybody he's a rescuer he's complicated and contradictory he's not just a stereotype He's not just one dimensional. He's got, he's got demen he's got depth to him. Like what gave him that depth? You guys, these are good comments. Doug says a wayward soul, but intriguing. Christine said uh, she worried about where he was going. Totes. Thanks, Christine. Got the difference between a minimum wage job and an illegal job that pays the bills. Understands right from wrong. Um, Okay, now we're getting into it. Good, Samantha. So how do you take a character we see for, and he doesn't even enter till page 19. So he's really on the stage for what, five pages? And in that time, we have to invest in him. So one of the ways Samantha points out is that he tries to hide his emotion over the fact that his grandma has chemo. This is a boy who loves his grandmother and he's, he's trying to be tough about the fact that he's clearly upset about her being sick. Um, Krista didn't get that he was a gangbanger. Interesting. It's not spoken like Star doesn't know, and this is her perspective, but the signs seem to be pointing to it. And one of the ways uh, I will say, I've obviously read the book. So one of the ways I know that is that he wants to talk to her dad, Big Mav, who used to be the head of the King Lords. So to me, I got the sense that this there was some kind of gang violence going on that he was a part of. And that's why I infer that. But uh, again, this is what's on the page, what the reader gleans, not necessarily what is right or wrong. So if you didn't get it as the editor of this piece, you might say, hey, it wasn't really clear if you need us to know this, that he was a gangbanger. Um, it's probably not relevant that we know it just yet, but we do need to know he's doing something like selling drugs, something bad. Um, his dimple, yeah, Marta, that, I thought that was, it's an innocent thing, right? A dimple is an endearing, innocent thing. So you take this gangbanger boy, this drug selling boy, and you give him a dimple and you make him care about his grandma. And what else, what else do we have? He loves his family, takes, he's taking care of his brother. He's taking care of his grandmother. He waits up late at night for his mother, even though, what do we know about her? She has some kind of substance abuse problem. And yet he waits up for her, even though he said, even though he feels like he's lost hope. And he says to Star, oh, you always see the best in someone, which is another clue to her character that we get through his mouth. Look how much, look how rich this is. Um, and so we learn something about each of them. Liked the way he spoke to Star. Yeah, he clearly is fond of her. He's respectful of her. He's protective of her. He's a drug dealer, but we see him as a child with her in a complex family situation. So she talks about being in the bathtub with their wee-wee and their wee-haw. That's another little innocent thing, right? Like it brings up a connotation that this is someone's little boy. And then when they were 10 years old, they had a very innocent kiss at vacation Bible school. What I love is that she's taking all these opposite expectations you would have if you just presented a character who rolled in as a drug dealing gangbanger, you're not going to get the full picture of who this is and likely you're not going to relate to him. You're not going to invest in him. You're not going to care when he gets shot. And it is crucial. The whole book depends on the fact that the reader cares. Um, he appeared to be a sensitive character who also seemed caught up in activities he'd rather not be involved in. I thought that's interesting, Sandy. I got that impression too, that he felt like he was doing what he had to do 
Why? Because he has a little brother he has to take care of because his mother is not taking care of them. And the woman who did, his grandmother, is not only sick, but she got fired for being sick. So that's more sympathy we're getting with the character, with the family, and with the background without for me, it didn't feel like spoon feeding and it didn't feel like too much, but this is a lot of mitigating information that might make a reader who would otherwise judge a character like Khalil take a step back and go, this is just a boy in a crap situation who's doing the best he can and feels he has no choices. That makes for an interesting dichotomy in a character. Um, in a pinch, did the right thing, trying to make ends meet for his family, Yes, selling drugs and gangbanging are not the same thing, but I do think he's doing both. I could be wrong. Uh, uses denial to cope with things he can't control. So that tells us something about who he is as a person too. He's not just a series of facts or sympathetic details about his history or who he, what, who he is right now, selling drugs or whatever he's into. He is a human being who feels like he can't reveal that vulnerability for whatever reason. He has to front. He can't let people see the real him. He's not comfortable with emotion. That's probably a big part of it, the emotional part. I'm guessing he feels all this deeply and that's not cool, I'm betting, at a party like this or in the circles he's running in. Um, only job he could get and who gave him that job, Star's dad, was minimum wage, wouldn't pay for what his family needed. When his grandma got fired for being sick, Susan says, and she was hooked. Uh, Tara points out that Star does refer to the Lord's gangbanging. I'm not sure if we know that he's a Lord yet, but we will learn that. So, okay, let's go to another minor character just to sort of see how this is woven in. Kenya. We talked about her a little bit. We know she likes drama. We don't have quite as much about her, but we do know a lot about her. What? Anybody want to? want to share what they gleaned by the way i said we were going to go an hour and that was a pipe dream so i'm planning to stick around for like another 15 20 30 minutes after that if you want to great if you need to go also fine because i know we haven't gotten to the dissection yet but we're going to do that in a sec the stank eye um yeah they share a brother we know that we know she's beautiful she describes her as looking like a model we know she's direct and tough wild and reckless Kenya's dad is a king. Yeah, we know that is king. And we know that, but we also know that uh, he spoils his little girl. He, he's clearly doing okay because he makes sure she never wears the same outfit twice. Um, this, oh, that's a great observation, Gayla, that these people felt really real from your experience. Um, Vicky says she had a hard time with her wanting to start the fight. I needed to know why. Yeah, she was not going to let that go. And to me, that was... It was funny and interesting, but it was also maddening. And so it, again, show versus tell. We are, the author is making us feel firsthand what Star feels, this frustration with her. Oh my God, girl, let it go. There's gunshots. And she still wants to go have a fight. And what does that tell us about her? She's shallow, I'll buy that. Drama queen, combative, always angry. Yeah, so this is a minor character. And look how much information we have about her. Okay, I'm going to skip to some big points I want to talk about sort of story craft elements the way we're doing now, but then I do want to go through and do the line by line thing because that's really instructive also. There were some other key parts of this story. Uh, we talked about suspense and tension, character, we talked about the plot, but I want to talk a little bit about point of view. So clearly this is first person. Um, so there's so as far as having a point of view, we know what it is like technically, but did this story have a clear point of view in the sense of perspective? Did you feel like you were deeply um, admitted to Star's direct experience? Tara asks a quick sidebar while you're thinking about that. Tara asks, how important is it that we know so much about this minor character, Kenya? Well, we don't know yet. <laughs> Partly it's because it illustrates a lot about Star by contrast. Partly it's her only friend, so it's a foot in this world where we know she has a foot in, the, in another world as well. So that will develop. And if it, that's a great point, because if it were to come about that Kenya is a very minor character or this is her only scene or something like that, would that much detail be important? I would argue that to a degree, yes, because another 
common error I see authors make is giving a lot of attention to the main characters and not worrying so much about not just supporting characters, but even the incidental characters. You want to put your reader in the story. You want them to live it and see it and feel they're a part of it. And how do we do that? Well, if it's by not making the extras in the background faceless, you know, even the woman checking someone out at a grocery store counter can have something specific about her. She's sitting there smacking her gum that brings her to life, that makes a picture come to life in the reader's mind, as opposed to just saying the checkout clerk, which tells us nothing. It's this cipher. And now we're not really clearly seeing it. As the author, you're not just the storyteller. You're not just the writer of the story. You're the director of photography. You're the director. You are the set decorator. You, you're everything. You're the costumer. You have to let us, you have to bring the whole movie to life for us. And you do it with these quick portraits of people, um, which is a good point. I mentioned Seven. Seven isn't a part of this scene. He doesn't seem important right now. But notice we even have a little clue of what Seven is like in the way he texts all caps in his giant hoodie that he would be mad if he knew she had. We get enough information that he's not just the faceless brother character, right? He's not just a placeholder for a, a prop of a character that we're gonna maybe come into play later. He is an individual. He's someone we begin to see breadcrumb, breadcrumb by breadcrumb, brush stroke by brush stroke. Angie Thomas is painting these characters. We may not need a lot of brush strokes about seven yet. He may come into play later, but she doesn't just start with like a stick figure. <laughs> she makes him somewhat believable. Um, okay, I asked a question about, what did I ask? The point of view. Um, yes, the info swirling around Kenya really informed us about Star, but it wasn't just the events that were happening around her. It was Star's perspective on the events. That's what brings us into the story, that we are not only seeing through her eyes, but we're inside her head, thinking what she thinks, feeling what she feels. What's interesting about this point of view, um, yeah, Bob says he was on Star's side in a heartbeat. Um, Kenya seems to care as much about what people think as Star. Yeah, she does. Um, good observation. That is Diane. Um Interesting. Jessica decided Star's perspective couldn't be trusted. She was too down on stuff. Her point of view did color everything, but you found it too depressing. So it's kind of like a personal preference that you did feel you had a sense of her perspective. You just didn't like it, which is a totally valid observation. What is interesting about this point of view and the reason I wanted to bring it up is it's first person, but it's not deep point of view, which is a weird little, like you expect that first person is because if they're narrating it, then aren't we in their head? Notice the voice in this, um, which we'll talk more about, but the in the sense of point of view, this isn't, we're not just inside Star's head living this directly. Because if we were, she wouldn't have to explain things to us, like that she works at a grocery store or like top of page 11. Sorry, you won't have the page number if you read the excerpt. She says, Ain't this some shit? Not even five minutes ago, I was stuck up become, because I go to Williamson. Now I'm lucky. So that's not her direct thought. That's her kind of turning to face the camera, if you will, and address us. So this is a first person, but it's a narrated first person. So notice that little sliver of difference. There are also deep first person stories where you are, you are the character and you're living what they live. But in this one, she is, she's living it. And then part of her is standing outside and letting us into parts of it. Not all of it. That's why we don't know everything about, like, um, I thought it was interesting that I didn't know if she really does care about what people think because she says she doesn't. But at that point, we do not get a glimpse inside what she's actually thinking. And I kind of think she does. Um, so that's, so the, the slight hair difference of perspective there allows the narrator voice, the author, to keep some things from the reader as a component of how the story is told. What do they want the reader to know when? Whereas in a true deep point of view, if the character's thinking it, feeling it, uh, reacting to it, we know it. Um, okay, and then the only other that we talked about show and tell, we talked about setting. I wanna talk a little bit about the voice. Um, part of what I think brings her to life as a character to me is her voice. Did you guys feel that way? Uh, Deborah says she's talking to us. 
Yeah, Marta felt like the voice was specific. Are there, uh, and feel free to raise your hand and unmute for this, were there specific places where the voice jumped out at you and gave you a sense of who she was or felt real or brought her to life? Uh, totally distinct voice, I think so too. And it's not just the dialect, um, which she isn't speaking in so much as like Kenya and some of the other characters. What was it about her voice? Like, for example, here's a question. Did you, did you get a humor, a sense of humor from her? I'm waiting to see. Yes. Uh, Vicky says she, in some ways, she felt she knew more about her than her friends. This was probably because I know her thoughts. Yeah. She's showing a certain thing to the people at the party. And then we're privy to more than that. So we have like a little bit more of an all access pass. We don't have the all access pass, but we have the backstage pass. Um, I got a lot of humor from Star and it's in specific lines. Like uh, she says something about the stank eye, which I think is hilarious. And she also says people who are given a stank eye are either. Uh, the thing about the stank eye is at some point you feel it on you, inviting you to kick some ass or have your ass kicked. Um, I thought that was funny. She talks about black Jesus she talks about, oh, what was the other, there was a, another really funny part. Oh, every time a, a sneaker is cleaned improperly, a kitten dies. Like she's really in the middle of all this, even with her discomfort and all this conflict, the humor comes through all the way through, which to me is a big part of not only who she is, but her hodum is universal. Yes, Julie says. Um, the way she thinks of things, the way she phrases them, it's funny. It shows personality. It makes her unique. Uh, Lisa says that there were so many character names introduced that made her want to leave the party, but she thinks in a sense, feeling that created a lot of suspense and tension for me. Um, yeah, there were a lot of names. I felt like to me, she didn't overdo it, but we needed a certain amount of that because otherwise it's a, first of all, she has to create a sense that this party is full of people, right? We need to feel that with Star. But you, but you don't just want those cardboard cutout characters. You have to make each of them somewhat real. And we even know something about Danasia, who never even comes on stage. But we know she was smack talking. <laughs> um, we know that she was then going to play the, oh, I wasn't talking about you. We know that she is angry at Kenya. We know that she's maybe a little passive aggressive. So these are real characters Angie Thomas is populating the party with so that not only do we get a sense of the crowded party, but who it's crowded with. All those, oh, this is a great point, Vicki. All those names made me feel an outsider-like star. That could be good or bad. It could backfire on the author and readers might disengage. Um, I did not. I don't know if y'all agree with that. Okay. Let's go through it line by line. So if you have the excerpt with you, this is a great time to pull it up. I'm going to share my screen and pull it up and we're just going to go through it together. Um, okay. We're all seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to say yes. Okay. Really wish we were in a room together. Okay. First line. I shouldn't have come to this party. We talked about suspense and tension and creating a sense of unease. From this very first line, Angie Thomas creates a sense of mm, discomfort, dread, maybe a suggestion that something is going to happen, or at least that she is fearful something is going to happen. So we have that little kernel of tension. I talked about dropping those breadcrumbs all the way through from the very first line. So readers go, what does that do? It creates a question in your mind. Why not? Why shouldn't you have come to this party? I believe I will keep reading to find out. That's how suspense and tension work together. I'm not even sure I belong at this party. Okay, so now we know we've answered one question. That's why she shouldn't have come to this party. But now we have a new question. Why doesn't she belong at this party? So now we keep reading. That's not on some bougie shit either. Voice. Right immediately, we're placed in the story and in Star's character. There are just some places where it's not enough to be me, neither version of me. There's a new question. What does that mean? What version of her? What places is it not enough to be her? Why does she feel that way? Notice how she's stringing us. She's breadcrumbing us into the story by making us, giving us just enough to orient us little by little. I talked about, I love metaphors, the brush strokes, just little by little, but also 
drawing us along so that we continue to want to know more. Big D's spring break party is one of those places. I squeeze through sweaty bodies and follow Kenya, her curls bouncing past her shoulders. So now she's going to paint this picture for us. A haze lingers over the room, smelling like weed, and music rattles the floor. Um, okay, so I'm, let's just skip to the last sentence of this graph, paragraph. Between, so we, we get the scene set for us, and then we immediately get another brushstroke of character. Between the headache from the loud-ass music, more voice, and the nausea from the weed odor, now we know she's not a partier, I'll be amazed if I cross the room without spilling my drink. So we know a lot of things from this one sentence. We know we know her a little bit about her voice. We know she's not a weed smoker. We know that she's the music's too much for her. Uh, from the first, from what we've read so far, we know she feels out of place and we know that she's uncomfortable. We're not even two, par we're two paragraphs in and look how much we're already learning. Um, now there's a little more scene setting. We break out the crowd, more voice that's written in a dialect so that it feels like the way she talks. Big D's house is packed. Um, and then we get a, this underscored idea. I've always heard that everybody and their mama comes to his spring break parties. And also there's the subtle question, who's Big D? Why does everybody come here? Where is he? Everybody except me. So now there's another little breadcrumb. She doesn't go to any of these parties. Um, and then we get a little bit more of her voice and humor where she says, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of babies are conceived the night of Big D's party. He always has it on the Friday of spring break because you need Saturday to recover and Sunday to repent. So notice that not only are we getting her voice, but already I feel like we're getting a sense of her intelligence. Um, she thinks of things in a way that I think not a lot of teenagers think of them. She thinks of the big picture and just the word repent to me is not one I think a lot of high school kids are just throwing around like that. Um, Stop following me and go dance car, star, Kenya says. People already say you think you all that. There's another breadcrumb, another brushstroke of character. I already read that one. We talked about it. Her putting down the drink, reinforcing the idea that she's out of her element. She's not comfortable with this. She's not a big drinker in general. Uh, now we're going to get some context about star and begin to fill in the picture. But notice how it is in... It never stops the forward momentum of the story. As we are getting a lot of information about her and her backstory and her situation, we are learning it in the course of this party going on and the action moving forward, mostly through context woven into the forward action. Kenya says, hey, I'm just saying, you act like you don't know nobody because you go to that school. Little breadcrumb. I've been hearing that for six years. Now we know how long she's gone there ever since my parents put me in Williamson Prep. Uh, notice again, this is, I talked about that little separation of point of view. Here's where we're seeing it. So if we're actually in her head, she knows how long she's gone there. She knows she's in Williamson Prep. You would never have this thought in your own head. Like, oh, I've been here, like you're at a party. I've been hearing that for all the six years I've been going to my school, Berkmar High School. Nobody thinks like that. So that's, that's our clue of what the point of view is. Whatever, I mumble. That's telling us her she's not engaging. She doesn't want to be a part of this conflict. That's beginning to paint a picture of her. And it wouldn't kill you not to dress like she turns up her nose as she looks from my sneakers to my oversized hoodie. That. Ain't that my brother's hoodie? Okay, so now we know she's not a shop dresser, as my friend says. Um, that her friend is judging her for it. That she's wearing her brother's hoodie. That creates another question our brother's hoodie. Now we have the answer to that question. What does that mean? We share an older brother, seven, but she and I aren't related. Her mom is seven's mama and my dad is seven's dad. Now here's another clue that we're in that slightly removed first person point of view. Crazy. I know that's an aside to us as her audience. So that's telling us there's that one little degree of separation in point of view. Yeah, it's his figures. You know what else people saying too? got folks thinking you're my girlfriend. Do I look like I care what people think? No, and that's the problem. Whatever. This is what I was talking about a minute ago. Does she care what people think? I don't know yet. It's an interesting breadcrumb that asks the question and doesn't answer it. And so it begins to create a sense of her character, but it's also not putting it all on the table just yet. Um, I'm going to keep doing this a little bit, but I want to sort of visit some of the questions here. 
and some of the comments. Uh, thank you, Joel, for posting the analysis again. Doug says that's a great first line. I agree. It's simple, but it creates something that makes you want to know more. Um, and a question of why, absolutely. Any question you can get readers wondering, like any of the journalism questions, who, what, why, where, when, how, um, that is going to keep readers engaged and asking questions. Now, really quickly, let me just address the trap of that, which is that some authors will try to make everything a question, and that's when your story becomes cryptic. We have to have enough to plant our feet. So you want, I call it good questions and bad questions. You have to give us enough information and context so that we understand who the characters are, what the situation is, what's going on. But if you give us nothing, it's like those vague book posts, right? Like, oh my God, I can't believe that just happened. I will never get over this. I don't know if I can handle it. And everybody just rolls their eyes because that's somebody begging for attention and it's so annoying. <laughs> and that's how we feel when we read it in a story too. If you say, um, this is the way you'll most commonly see that, a character will say, um, I, I was afraid to see him after that night that we had together where everything went so horribly wrong. I couldn't even think about it. I, uh, you know, the fight we had was just too bad to even talk about. Great. Something happened, but we don't know what. So you might as well be talking. You might as well be vague booking. Like we don't have enough to invest in. But if you tell us, you know, the day we broke up, we had a terrible fight about the secret. Um, see, even that is too vague. You want to keep that secret a secret. Great. But we need enough around it. We broke up because... I wanted to go to college and he wanted me to stay in our hometown. But uh, once I found out what he was hiding, there was no way I was staying. That's a good secret. That's a good question because now we know enough about their situation that we are curious what that secret is, but we can at least relate to who these people are and have some sense of what their situation is. Um, so that was a long explanation. And we get her attitude in line two, absolutely, starting to paint character, summarizes the entire book in a way, Tara says. Her going to the party is the domino. Um, Vicki, the rest of this will be on recording. If you guys have to go, because we said an hour and I lied, you can watch the end on the recording later. Um, humor hits with the guy's dress and the condom joke. So Rhonda brings up a point that I'm so glad you did because I wanted to say this. Wonderful to reread. Because now we can see what she means by neither version of me. When we are going to, when you're going to analyze something like this, the reason I do it in these three stages, and I always start with a cold read, is because you can't really pick this stuff out as minutely as we're doing until you know the story, until you have your feet planted in. I've talked to editors who tell me they don't do that. They just start editing. And I'm like, I don't know how you can do that because you've got to know who the players are, where the, where the story is going, so you can see how the author does or does not convey that on the page and get us there. So that's the best way to analyze anything. Read it once, or uh, we're going to do future versions of this where we're going to do TV shows, movies, uh, songs, commercials, journalism pieces. You can analyze anything, and you do it by first reading it, letting yourself feel the story, talk about the big picture stuff we did, and then go back and you reread it and you start pinpointing where you found that stuff. So we did it earlier with like the suspense and tension elements, the character elements. So those of you who said you did feel engaged or you didn't feel engaged with Star, then we went back through and we started looking at what do we know about her? How do we know it? Was it on the page? You can't do that until you have a sense of the story. So great point, Rhonda. Thank you. Um, yes, this is a character who ostensibly straddles POV. And by that, I think you mean perspective. And I agree with that. She is, that's what the whole story is about. And that's set up from the very beginning. She is straddling these two worlds. Okay, I'm going to stop there with the analysis uh, because we are at 6.09 and I kind of wanted to leave time for questions and discussion. But if there are no questions in discussion and y'all really like this line by line thing, there is this, this is a very richly layered text and you can pick apart every single line the way we're doing for what Angie Thomas is doing with it, how that line is multitasking. And that's the strongest writing is when every single line does more than just one thing. It's creating a lot of different elements of the story. So I'm happy to keep doing that. I've got one vote for analyzing. 
Um, if anybody would like to, hang on, I can't see your, I can't see hands up. Joel, if there are hands, would you just pipe in there and uh, analyze? An okay, never mind. Never mind on the hands. We'll just keep going. Um, okay. I'm going to skip around a little bit because I want to make sure we get through enough on this. So this is the paragraph. If you're following my little cursor here, this is where we learn a little bit about Kenya, that she's flawless and she's perfect. Uh, she never wears the same outfit twice. Her daddy King makes sure of that. She's the only person star hangs out with. And now we get a little more context on star. It's hard to make friends when you go to a school that's more context information we need 45 minutes away and you're a latchkey kid who's only seen at her family store. So now we're getting a sense of her whole life, not just who she is, but who she is in the world. She goes to this school every day and she works, it seems like the rest of the time. She does not even, she lives in this neighborhood and does not have time to know who any of these people are. The only person she hangs out with is Kenya. And why? Right here, because of our connection to Seven. This tells us a lot about Star. She's messy as hell. Now we get a lot of information about Kenya. There's a lot of different ways to paint character through their actions, through their words, through their behavior, through their reactions, and through other characters' perspectives on them. Angie Thomas uses all of those. And in this paragraph, we're getting a perspective, actually, yeah, in this paragraph, we're getting perspective on Kenya from what Star thinks of her. Um, but then we also get a little information about Star slid in really organically. I wish she'd stop picking fights so she can use her trump card. That's her dad. Hell, I could use mine too. Everybody knows you don't mess with my dad, Big Mav, and you definitely don't mess with his kids. Still, you don't see me around going around starting shit. Now, this becomes important. Her dad was a former leader of one of the gangs, and that becomes essential in the story, and she's laying the groundwork for it right here. But notice it doesn't stop the action. It doesn't pull us out of the story to go, well, look, a nugget of context. It's just slid in there real smoothly. I have a course on backstory. Context is one of the ones that you will use most often. And this, all this stuff I'm pointing out right now is all backstory in the form of context. But notice it's just part of the tapestry. It's not, um, one of the reasons backstory is a, is, can be a trap is because especially early in the story, I talked earlier about authors think, oh, writers need or readers need to know this stuff about the character, so I'll tell them. You're going to stop your story cold. You're going to stop your forward momentum, yank your reader out of the story, and they may or may not keep reading. But if you weave it into the forward action like this as just a part of the tapestry, Jay Hicks says, uh, tiny nuggets in so many ways. That's how you create rich, clear characters and further the story move the story forward as you are painting these fuller pictures of your characters and what they're wrestling with. Um, okay, then we got the stank eye, which I think is very fun. And I think it's funny that Danasia is totally ignoring Kenya and while Kenya is just glaring holes at her. Um, and then Kenya starts, it's interesting, Kenya starts talking about what's going on at school with this meaningless little gossipy drama. And Listen to the, like this one little bit. Look how much it says. For real, I say what I'm supposed to. That is such a telling detail about her character. That lets us know she's trying to fit in. She wants, maybe wants to be liked or to meet people's expectations or she's a people pleaser. And she does not, she doesn't care about this, but she doesn't say that. In a minute, we see her lie. She's trying really hard to fit in, to make people like her, to say what they want her to hear. That becomes key to her conflict in the story as she straddles these two words. Um, she says, there's no time to talk when bagging groceries. Oh, okay. Nancy says, it just occurred to me she works in the local store, but doesn't know any of these kids, wouldn't she? Deborah says, she says, there's no time to talk when bagging groceries, but I agree. I think it, it should, that's a great observation, Deborah. It shows that part of her stays removed. I think throughout this scene, we see how she keeps herself removed. Uh, I promised somebody, I forgot Chris, maybe, uh, that we would talk about the gunshots. That was a great observation. The one time she really seems removed when we wouldn't expect her to is when gunshots are going off behind her at the party. Ordinarily, I would also pick up on what you did, Chris or Craig or whoever said that, I'm sorry, please feel free to out yourself and, and get your uh, props for it. But the one time we would expect a big reaction from her, there isn't one, but I think that's deliberate. 
because what it does is create a sense of garden heights. This is so common. She even says a couple of things in here about, um, oh, I had it marked earlier that I don't try to see who got shot or who did it. You can't snitch if you don't know anything. Like this is just a rule of her existence. This happens often enough that she knows what's going on. Um, she says, he said, uh, Khalil says, always some shit. Can't have a party without somebody getting shot. To me, the horror of her react, the fact that she doesn't react heightens the horror of this, that this is such a commonplace occurrence in this neighborhood. It heightens the picture that we're getting of the neighborhood because we're, we're understanding that, right? This is a party at which nobody really reacts that much if you get shot. She even says when everybody's stampeding out, stepping on somebody's shoes would be an offense that you might get shot for if people weren't already running from the shots that were being fired. So fantastic observation, whichever brilliant one of you made that, but notice that it also had a, I think it had a deliberate purpose in the story to evoke the picture even more clearly. Um, yeah, Nathan says, not a big deal in our neighborhood. Marta says it's normal, scary place to live. Yeah, so we're continuing. Remember, we painted that picture of Khalil, of someone who is a, a kid who wants to do the right thing, who's facing all these situations that make him unable to do it. Notice how Angie Thomas, she's not just saying, oh, these kids grow up in a dangerous environment and they don't have resources and nobody's taking care of them and they don't have a lot of options. She's showing it. She's letting us see it firsthand and feel it. And how do you make people relate to something that is outside their experience? You make it real and human and relatable to them, which is the power to me of this story. This is a story a couple of you pointed out, not your usual genre, not a world in which you would normally read. It was a huge bestseller. It was a major motion picture that I think did pretty well. Why did it have this kind of appeal? To me, the most powerful stories are the ones that take something incredibly specific and find the universal in it. So there's a lot about this that we can relate to, I think. Um, who hasn't felt out of place? Who hasn't felt invisible? Who hasn't felt like they have to straddle two worlds or please people? Who hasn't felt like there are factors in their environment or their life that make it hard for them to do the right thing, whatever the right thing is, um, that, that make them, that hasn't felt like they mattered. There's a lot of universalities that this really specific story hits on, but it's also incredibly powerful because it takes what to some people is the other, this world of garden heights that may not be, you know, a certain reader's experience and it makes it human to you and it makes it real to you. These aren't just stereotypes or people you see on the news or stories that you hear. It's not just those two figures running down the volcano. It's starring Khalil. So now we care. Now we understand. I, like I always say, story is incredibly powerful. It's how we affect change. It's how we move people. It's how we get people to re-examine their parameters and expand their boundaries. Um, I don't think it's an accident that gay marriage became legal after Will and Grace brought gay people into our living rooms. You cannot, you cannot remove yourself from somebody who becomes human and real to you. And that's the power of story. That's what I think she does really well here. And why it was a bestseller is she took a really narrow specific world, not common to every reader and made them care about it. And she did it with some of these techniques we're talking about. Um, yeah, Marty says it hit on Black Lives Matter. It actually became kind of the anthem book and movie of Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and again, it, it took that concept, right? Black Lives Matter is just a slogan. It's just a rally or, or you know a demonstration that you might see of people marching in the street. It, it's just a news headline, except it's not in this story. It becomes real and human to you because these are people that you have begun to care about. Story is the most powerful force. I mean, the sword, the pen is mightier than the sword. And this is why. Uh, Jay says he sees how other people live, how they're treated. And you always care about the outcast, you know, write an underdog story and you're going to hook almost everybody. And that drives, oh, Jay's a girl. I'm sorry. Look at me being all gender, um, gender judgy. Sorry. I made an assumption there. I apologize. Um, and thanks for sharing your pronouns. So Hang on, let's go through just a little bit more. Um, if you, as you need to start dropping off, go ahead. I'm gonna go to 6.30 just cause I like round numbers. 
Uh, so let me really quick tell those of you who have to go, I'm going to send you a handout. I'm going to send you the link to the YouTube uh, that's streaming right now in case you would like to watch parts of it that you missed or rewatch it because we moved really fast. And I'm going to send you uh, information about the next one. I'm going to try to do these more regularly. So if you guys like, if you can give me some feedback, that would be great. I may send you a little survey, like a two question survey, just to help me figure out what you need from this and what would what would best suit your needs. Um, and other than that, thank you for coming. And I'm just going to keep talking. So uh, I'll end it at 630. And meanwhile, if you have to go, thanks for joining. So uh, somebody mentioned this. Where is it? Did I already go by it? The HODM line? OK, here's here we get a little more information. Um, Kenya lets her know that we gonna handle her tonight. Kenya now has revealed her goal for this evening, which is to have Star be her wing woman in a fight. And this is news to Star who wants no part of that. So now we know another, that's where we get that breadcrumb about her. That's why you beg me to come so you can have a tag team partner. She has the nerve to look offended. That's perspective. That's her reaction to how Kenya feels about this and reacts to this that tells us something about Star. Star thinks she overstepped and how dare she look offended. It ain't like you had nothing else to do or anybody else to hang out with. I'm doing your ass a favor. More context about Star, another sort of reinforcing the fact that this is her only friend in Garden Heights, the city where she lives. Really, Kenya, you do know I have friends, right? She rolls her eyes hard. Only the whites are visible for a few seconds. I just love the visual of that. Like, Rolling your eyes is one of those cliched phrases you'll see a lot in stories and you kind of go, okay, say it a little more originally. I kind of think Angie Thomas did here because I have this clear picture of this incredibly exaggerated eye roll. Them little bougie girls from your school don't count. Now we have a grain of context, what kind of school she goes to. And now we know more about Star when she defends them. They're not bougie and they do count. I think now we're going to get another grain of context. Maya and I are cool. Not sure what's up with me and Haley lately. Two sentences. We now know her two friends at school and that she's having trouble with one of them. That's a lot. And honestly, if pulling me into a fight is your way of helping my social life, I'm good. God damn, it's always some drama with you. So that tells us something about Kenya and something about how Star feels about her and about that behavior and about some something about Star in general. She doesn't like drama. Please, Star. <laughs> she stretches the please extra long, too long. So again, that's this nice notice that we're not just seeing this scene, we're hearing it. Um, there's a lot of like the details of the weed, the smells. We're using all of our senses to bring this to life, the bodies, the sticky drink that spills. Um, okay, now we're going to get a little more context. She gets a text. Since I've ignored his calls, Chris texts me instead. So we don't even know who Chris is yet. Can we talk? I didn't mean for it to go like that. This is good question. It's cryptic. We don't know what happened, but all we need to know right now is uh, something went down with Chris and it was not good. And she's upset about it because she's not answering his phone calls. Of course he didn't. He meant for it to go a whole different way yesterday, which is the problem. And we know that whatever he wants, she's not okay with and he pushed it and she's mad. Uh, so that's a lot of context, even though we don't know what the thing is yet. We're oriented. Um, I'm not sure what I want to say, but I'd rather deal with him later. Kenya, somebody shouts. Okay, then they don't notice her. We don't need to go through that. I want to get to some of the juicy stuff with um, Khalil. Let's skip over to Khalil, actually. Um, okay, she's left alone. She's feeling incredibly uncomfortable. Um, this first we get this really interest. So the theme of this we've talked about the black and white, the two worlds, her feeling invisible, not feeling like she fits into either world. Look how how well this is set up under the guise of just star talking about her life. Uh, as long as I play it cool and keep to myself, I should be fine. So that tells us something about who she is. The ironic thing is, though, at Williamson, I don't have to play it cool. I'm cool by default because I'm one of the only black kids there. That's information. But it's also plays into the theme, right? Here in this world, she's a complete misfit. But in this white world, she's cool just because she's Black. Now we're beginning to understand something of the racial themes that she's facing. I have to earn coolness in Garden Heights. And that's more, diff that's more difficult than buying retro Jordans on release day. And then I love this line because to me, it sums up so much of the theme. 
Funny how it works with white kids though. It's dope to be black until it's hard to be black. And we're going to see that play out throughout the entire story. Okay, now here comes Khalil with a great big entrance, right? He's larger than life. Star, a familiar voice says. The sea of people parts for him like he's a brown-skinned Moses. That's a very multitasking line. We know something of his power in this community. The sea of people parts for him. Brown-skinned Moses is not only funny, uh, and it gives a little bit of her voice, but it conveys a little bit of something of a brown-skinned Moses. This is not just a dude arriving at a party. This is like... <gasps> Khalil's here. Like you can see that scene, how the, the party just stops. This is, a, this is someone who's important. He's someone who's probably popular. Guys give him daps and girls crane their necks to look at him. He smiles at me and dimples ruin any G persona he has. So, so now we've got, we're already working with these contrasts. He's someone who's magnetic. People part for him. Everybody knows who he is. And yet he smiles at her and his cute little dimples ruin his gangster persona. Already she's painting these contrasts in his character. Khalil is fine. No other way of putting it. And I used to take baths with him. Not like that, but way back in the day when we would giggle because he had a wee wee and I had what his grandma called a wee ha. I swear it wasn't perverted though. Okay, so not only does it create the attraction that somebody pointed out between them, it, it brings that innocence in I talked about. Um, it shows us that they were how close they were. She knows his grandmother. So that's going to be key also. He hugs me. Here's another great little detail. Smelling like soap and baby powder. What's cleaner and more innocent than that? That's just this very subtle little sensory detail that continues. Thank you, Bob. Good to see you. Um, that continues to paint this picture, these contrasts in his character. Uh, so then we know they haven't seen each other for a while, and we know why. School and the basketball team keep me busy, I say, but I'm always at the store. We're getting context on not just who she is, but who she is in the world of, in her world. So we're building out, continuing to build out her story and the, and the world of the story. You're the one nobody sees anymore. His dimples disappear. Tension. He wipes his nose like he always does before a lie. A lie is almost always tension. Um, I've been busy obviously. Now she knows what that means. Uh, when you grow up in Garden Heights, you know what busy really means. I'm not going to say the cross word in case it offends people. I wish he wasn't that kind of busy though. I don't know if I want to tear up or smack him. Aren't we getting a lot of information about how she feels about him and how she feels about what she thinks he's involved in? The way he looks at me with those hazel eyes makes it hard to be upset. And then we talk about some of the stuff we discussed about vacation bar, um, Bible school. This is where we see the attraction, but we also see the innocence of them. They went to Bible school and they kissed in the church basement. Um, I might not be answering Chris's. Oh, now we get more context on who Chris is. I actually have a boyfriend. I might not be answering Chris's calls or texts right now, but he's still mine and I want to keep it that way. Now we get all the information in the form of conversation natural conversation that a character would make with another character having not seen them for a few months talking about things they both know how's your grandma and Cameron notice how the author doesn't stop and go you know I knew his grandma from so and so and Cameron is his brother we don't need that we'll get it from context we're in the story they I grandma sick though and now we, he tells her in the course of the way anyone would tell a friend what's going on with her so we get exposition but in a way that moves the story forward organically. Um, now we know about her chemo. Somebody pointed out his laugh that doesn't show his dimples, that he's trying to hide his concern about his grandma. And then she says, is your mama helping with Cameron? Good old star, always looking for the best in people. You know she ain't helping. So now we know a lot about all three of these characters, four of these characters. We know who Cameron is. We can probably infer that's his little brother. We know that star always looks for the best in people, according to Khalil. We know that his mom is not helping out with the family for whatever reason. And we know that Khalil is kind of fed up with her and that he says, always looking for the best in people, you know she ain't helping. Like he's had it. There's two lines, two dot lines of dialogue that we get all that information is. I'm going to stop here, but notice how I talked earlier about how dense this text is. Notice how there is almost not a single line that does not multitask in some way to create character to further the story, to raise the stakes, to invest the reader, to create suspense or tension, to draw us into her point of view, to create the setting, 
to um, continue the momentum of the story. All of this is laced into what seems at first, as some of you pointed out, to just be a casual party scene until the shots start. Um, I'm going to stop there. Jay, I love your comment. He says, I'm wowing on first quick read. I thought it was overly wordy. Now I see every word carried power. When you start reading like this, read it through once. Just, just enjoy it. Read it like a, I don't take a single note on my first read. Then go through and do what we're doing here and start asking yourself questions, not only about what each line is doing, but what element of story craft is served by that and how. That's how you learn whether you are putting your intentions on the page or not. I have loved doing this. It's my favorite, most pedantic thing to do, and it drives my husband crazy. So thank you all for letting me indulge that. I hope it's been helpful. I am considering doing a lot more of these. I'd love to hear from you. Um, so just wait for my follow-up email. And if you want to give me a clue um, what you might like to see in the future, or if this was valuable to you, that would be great. Have a great night. Read the rest of the story. And thanks again.